a person who doesn't need much introduction, Luis Betancourt. Um, of all the brilliant people I met at SFI, he's my role model. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because he's a truly transdisciplinary person. So he started, uh, he's trained as a physicist and has papers such as non-intercommuting cosmic <laughs> strings in 1997 physical review letters. But then he was really interested and he still, he still is in cognitive and social systems. But it's not like some other physicists maybe that we know that not, do not really kind of go into the details and understand these complex cognitive social systems. He goes and really studies psychological literature, sociological literature. He goes in the systems he he's interested in, like cities, slams, he works with governments and NGOs, and really tries to understand the system very humbly. And then he applies his machinery of various models, evolutionary models, statistical physics models, co various complex system science models to study these systems at different scales. And that's really admirable, uh, this breadth of knowledge, but also the humility in approaching these systems. And then the 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 the, the, the models that, you, that, that then he derives are really helping us to better understand them, these systems and improve them. So it has real world consequences and benefits. And that's who I would want to be if I had your energy and <laughs> intellect. And you should all strive also. So thank you so much. You are a fitting uh, <laughs> ending of this um, lecture series. Thank so. you, Mirta. That's, that's a lot to live up to. So uh, I'll try. It's, it's going to be a, a somewhat strange presentation. I was very sort of divided as to what to do because I had sort of a talk I was going to give you. It was very mathy and full of like formulas and basically based on a couple of papers. But since this is sort of the last talk of the meeting, I thought I'd give some uh, uh, part reflection and part still, you know, framework development about how people think about sustainability. It was said by some of you particularly in the introduction, that maybe we don't have a science sustainability and so on, how to define it. So I teach a course on sustainable systems, a graduate course as well, where I've been trying to teach myself what people know and how could you bring you know, all this exciting but somewhat dispersed field into some logical framework. So I'll start actually with that. I hope that's okay. And then I'll tell you a little bit about uh, collective action problems, which we've touched on here from certain perspectives, but I feel they're sort of still half the world of other approaches that are left. So I want to touch on that because I think it's important. If we want to be working at sort of the highest level, we need to be aware of them uh, in some cases. Some of this comes from economics, other social sciences, and so on. Uh, and, uh, and then, uh, part three, I'll go into this theme of information as a source of drive towards collective dynamics. And you'll see what I mean by that. What I'll try to do is to provide a somewhat fundamental entry point for all agents in complex systems. So I'll try to make a point of principle, and then I'll show you a little bit how it works in some cases. It's not, you know, it's, it's something in search of a, a more sort of general theory, so, so there's a lot of work to be done there, but there are already a lot of things that one can say from, from a principle point of view. Then I'll just reflect. Okay, I'm also plugging a book, as you can see. There's an exemplar here. It's half promise to Sanjay Jain, but if no one wants it, if he doesn't want it, then I know Tom maybe said he wanted it, so you guys fight over it. I don't want to take it home. Okay, so the book, you know, it, it, I'm not gonna talk about cities specifically today, but uh, as Mirda kind of uh, said, you know, when you look at whether cities or human societies, you have to bring a lot of perspectives and a lot of different uh, theoretical and modeling approaches to these problems. And so the book is an attempt at synthesis of what happened in the last 15 years in the field, which is very exciting. But it has things like related to what Elsa was talking about, about using uh, theories of information to try to try and understand the pattern of inequality and in distribution in cities. It has a last chapter about uh, economic growth and information, which is very much in the spirit of what I'll talk about today. And it also has chapters about diversity and measures and so on that have a lot more to do with uh, ecology and, and, and traditions there. Okay. So, so with that said, so is the work of many people. Here are some of them that I worked for a long time. There are many more in institutions and so on, but this is important to say. All good work kind of depends on, 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 on the soul and, and, and work of many people, and, and this is really a very interdisciplinary group. I keep updating this a little bit, and there are always people that are not here. So, okay, so what's the problem? And I want to ask, what's the problem of sustainability? Okay, just to start there. Uh, and in some sense, th these first slides are from this, this course I, I mentioned. So bear with me, they're a little bit basic. So the problem in some sense is that, I'll start with the good news. 
there's been an unprecedented rise in ES population, but particularly human living standards over the last, you can pick your period, but something like 150 years. In some countries much more recently, as you know. But these improvements came at the cost of climate stability, well-being for other life on Earth, global material flows, and justice and equity among humans, right? So that's sort of an attempt at summary about what the problems are. I use these four things as sort of lenses to then uh, organize how to go in, in the course, and so on. So but the problem is that a lot of this growth has been based on extraction, basically. Based on, you know, materials that are not renewable, energy sources that are not renewable, and to some extent, as you know, relationships between people that are not, that are not fair and that some more extractive of the labor of some people. So this is kind of not <laughs> the way we want to live. And so if we want to live, you know, for, for a long, long time as a species, uh, and, and these problems are creating mounting instabilities, for which we don't know what's really going to happen, but probably nothing good, right? Um, so the solution really is kind of to create, to redesign the system, all the whole system, which is a system of uh, uh, open end. So I'm asking for open-ended human development. This is kind of not always accepted. People think about degrowth and so on. I don't agree with that. But also justice, equity, ecological well-being, and so on. So this is a systems problem. I think so. Therefore, it makes sense to be discussing a place like ICTP and for people from complex systems, because in some sense we have a lot of the elements. We have the solar panels. We have a lot of people thinking about justice. We have a lot of game theory. But how to put it together in a way that works, right? How can you imagine and test that is really, I think, in my mind, the problem. Okay. So I use this kind of trope. I was talking to Tom about this, which is a very simplifying picture, but I think it's useful. And so if you don't remember anything else, remember these questions, okay? Because it's simple to remember. So uh, often people th think about uh, the challenge of sustainability or sustainable development in terms of these three things. One is prosperity, which you can maybe equate a little bit with economic growth, but you should be a little bit more, you know, it should be a little bit softer and nicer than just GDP growth and so on. But that's important. If you ask anyone who's poor, they'll tell you that. Um, there's, of course, the environment, which means uh, climate change, but also means biodiversity, land uses, and a bunch of other things. And there's equity, right, which means many different things. It means inequality, but also means people's ability to have a decent life, right? And the point about showing you this as a triangle is that each one of these edges, we like edges here, right, is, is a potential paradox, right? So for example, typically we know how to create prosperity by busting the environment, right? We just, we just consume stuff, turn it into goods, so that's, that's how we've been doing it. So it's relatively easy to create economic growth in an extractive way, but it's much harder to do it in a non-extractive way. Is it possible even? So each one of these, you know, likewise, it's, uh, you know, can you increase equity, which of course we want and we spent a lot of the meeting on, without also busting the environment or without stopping prosperity growth? You know, a lot of people think that you cannot. You get one or the other. And the most simple models give you one or the other, but they don't give you both. So having said that, if you look a little bit at the history of nations that we consider nice nations, at least from our perspective today, like in Europe, for example, then you think that over time they've done these three things. They have a better relationship with the environment they had before, not to say it's perfect, they uh, have created greater equity than, say, you know, 100 years ago or maybe even 50 years ago, not to say it's perfect. And they're quite rich by historical standards. So it's possible to do it. It's been done. But it actually doesn't happen quickly or simply. It's somehow a big systems thing. And that's really the challenge is how do you take, you know, these three things to not be contradictions. So I ask my students to really go and say, give me examples, there it is, of general positive answers to this. How could you do both, right? And usually this means that you have to change how you're doing each one of these things, right? You cannot create prosperity by just consuming materials and mining and so on. You have to invent ways in which you're using maybe more renewable materials and so on. Maybe you can even do a better job that's faster. But you have to put, it usually requires innovation, right? It requires changing the way you do things and do them in a different way. We don't know exactly what the limits are. I think a lot of people read these potential contradictions as hard limits. Like, again, you cannot have prosperity without uh, equity or environment. But I don't think that so. So part of the question here for us as scientists is how do you evade these uh, would-be paradoxes? You have a question. Yeah, what are you about Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Well, that's why I didn't say wealth, right? Or, or GDP, yeah. yeah. I'm leaving it soft, right? I'm not defining it super, super yeah. well. But because this, this narrative of these things being kind of contradictory starts falling apart when you think about prosperity as a, as a psychological welfare. It's not psychological welfare. Yeah, I don't think that's enough. It's not necessarily contingent on exploiting the environment. Right? Yeah, but that's not enough. You know, people need stuff. They need to have, to have access to some things. Not, they don't need, like, you know, to a mountain of stuff, but they need stuff. If you ask anyone who's poor or anyone who experienced an economic downturn, they need to be able to afford, afford services and a few things and so on. And, and I think that's the great miracle of the last decades is that that's become better for a lot of people on Earth. Yeah. That is supported by, uh, anyway, those paradoxes being present in other parts. Yeah, yeah. Not that they are, net, like, they are still there, but really that in order to have that, you still need to have uh, these paradoxes really strong in other places. Well, so you need to understand the, the source of these paradoxes really yeah. well, scientifically, and then you need to analyze that. But, but we know that what you're saying is true to some extent today. For example, if you look at carbon emissions, the fact that the US and Europe are reducing their carbon emissions, which is good, from, also means China's emitting a lot for us, right? Because they produce, for example, a lot, of, a lot of the manufactured goods that we consume. And then there's all the transportation and so on. Garbage, for example. Yeah, exactly. Like exactly. Else, right. Well, well, I'm saying that we don't know how to do these three things at once. We don't even know how to do two things at once, actually, right? So even though sometimes we've done it a little bit, but we want to do a lot more, right? We want to be much better with the environment, hopefully much more prosperous, at least for countries and populations that are poor, and in much fairer and equitable societies, right? We want more of each. <laughs> and, that's, and we want it quickly, right? We want it just like in our lifetimes. That's the sustainable development goals. Okay, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. I just want to make you think. But Brian, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So you could think of having actually a constructive, symbio more symbiotic, whatever that means, relationship with the environment. So, for, so that happens, obviously we do that a little bit even in cities, right? We create environments that, yes, are artificial, but for example, the great, one of the great discoveries of the last few decades when people started doing biodiversity surveys, and I know this has a lot of caveats, is that large cities in general have more biodiversity because we put more resources. We have parks and trees and we like a lot of things. They also are a lot of rats and so on. But you know, but we create environment. We don't like to live in dead environments, actually. We like to live in, in, in beautiful, thriving environments in some way. And I think even that kind of idea has been evolving. A lot of landscaping and architectural uh, uh, lens, uh, is changed to be more natural and, and more interesting and so on. Yes, so that's, that could be a positive relationship. I'll get to that in a moment. So, so just want to make you think. So if nothing else, you know, remember this and keep in mind, how do I do this? A lot of you guys were interested in equity and collaboration. How don't you bust the other two things, right? At least you have to keep three things in mind all at the same time. Three things I think is possible, okay? Okay, so now. I want to say something about the so-called laws of sustainability. Yes, people talked about laws, as in more or less laws in physics, okay? It's not exactly like laws in physics. You'll see actually they are very related to laws of physics, but I thought it was an important framing uh, to do. And this, this came up when you guys introduced uh, the conference as well. Uh, is there sort of a scientific framework to think about this? Now, this stuff is a little bit old. It was formulated maybe in the 90s as sort of a synthesis by Dana Meadows, who Brian brought up. But, uh, but I want to just walk you through in the, in the next few minutes, okay? So, so first I want to start with any complex system you can imagine, and a little bit of physics and biology, right? This is super simple, but there's a system. We're gonna say in a moment what the system could be, but it could be ICTP, it could be a city, it could be even a nation. 
And because of the nature of complex systems, it needs material flows. It needs water and materials and maybe assembled goods coming in. Those are the green cycles. And uh, it needs energy come in and emits, dissipates some of this energy as heat, as any dissipative system must. It's just the laws of physics. And also emits some wastes, usually these wastes, into the environment. So there's an extractive activity in the environment. There are wastes that go. But the, all, because the Earth system is closed, everything must cycle. Right? So this is the problem with carbon. We put it out, but then it cycles in the atmosphere. CO2 is very long-lived. So it's just going to be there until the environment you know, processes it, or buries in the ocean or whatnot, and then comes up to us back as rock or air or whatever. So this is sort of the way it works in general. But the problem is that we're pumping a lot of wastes and a lot of not quite heat, but it's mostly the problem of wastes and the problem of extraction, that we basically are messing with these cycles without actually taking care of the entire cycle, so that the cycle kind of is depleting and accumulating uh, various quantities, you can imagine, in various places. And this is creating a lot of disruption to natural ecosystems, who actually are doing both the supply and the trash removal for us. So, okay, so this is kind of a way to think about it. And, you know, usually if people say matter cycles, energy flows. It's kind of something you can print on a T-shirt. This is from Morowitz. But this is basically the laws of physics, right? So, so why, why is it like this? And what is a sustainable or unsustainable system, right? So I want to ask that question. Where's, but also, where's society? Where's the economy? Where's knowledge? And so on. Okay. So these are the laws of sustainability as Dana Meadows kind of formulated them. And they're very simple. Uh, and the claim here... The fourth one is a little fuzzy, but the claim here is that if you took care of this, you got a sustainable system. Okay, so that's a big claim. It's kind of interesting. And the first three are kind of, they build on top of each other, and they're relatively simple. As you can see, come from that picture. Every renewable resource must be used at or below the rate at which it can regenerate itself. Okay, so I'll get to that in a moment. But one example is fisheries, right? Well, that started here. Um, Every non-renewable resource must be used at or below the rate at which a renewable substitute can be developed. So partly we're trying to do this with plastics or you know, maybe uh, um, some other materials and so on. Third, every pollution stream must be emitted at or below the rate at which it can be absorbed or made harmless by natural uh, systems of the world. Right. So this is, again, just talking about those wastes and so on. But you see that this is a rate a rate comparison. We are doing something as humans. We're going faster and faster and creating more and more because we have more of us. And these rates are not being absorbed or supplied in, in the rest of the system. And then the last, so, th so these three laws where there's a field of ecological economics, which, which is a little bit uh, at the side of mainstream economics, but exists and has journals and so on. One of the figures that was important was Herman Daly. We talked a lot about this uh, with Sanjay when we were here in the previous meetings. But it's basically the laws of physics and ecosystems, right? It's just the ecosystems as energy and material flows, if you will. It's just quite simple. But the last one is kind of different, right? When we spend the entire meeting on the, on the last one, if I could simplify, which is that it says that capital stocks and resource flows must be equitable, distributed, and sufficient to generate a good life for everyone. Not necessarily equal, but fair. So this is the social part, where all the stuff that's cycling and all the growth and so on needs to be fairly distributed. And this is, uh, Dana Meadows uh, attributes this to Colin Rick Robert, who was the guy, who, who knows who he was? So this guy is a medical doctor in Sweden. Sweden, Sweden, yeah? You would read his book in school? So he wrote a little book that became adopted by all the children in Sweden's, Swedish schools, I am told. I have not been to a Swedish school as a student. Uh, but Henrik can tell us. OK. And so apparently Greta read this book, and everyone, you know, all those Swedish activists and so on read this book. And it's a book about sustainability, about a social contract for sustainability uh, for stable and forward-looking societies. OK, it's kind of, it's, it has science in it, but it's also kind of a manifest of what it should be. Um, and, and this is kind of echoed a lot through UN documents and so on, all this framing about justice and equity and forward-looking prosperous societies. Are there. So it's kind of interesting. But why do we care about, why in this framework do we care about actu, actu, uh, equitable distribution and a good life for everyone? I mean, we're dealing just with flows of stuff. So why does this become important? 
well, okay, it feels fair, right? So that feels important. But if you don't have this, what happens? Revolution. Revolution. You know, people won't agree, and the first three cannot be done, and we're doomed, right? It's a doom loop. So it's more, in some sense, because of that, because it's the human social system or the, all the humans driving these flows and so on and having to agree on how to manage them collectively, because it's a collective action problem, uh, that really drives the fourth. So it's kind of how does the human system deal with these bounties and these managements and these restrictions. Okay, so I thought that was in interesting to say. But just to give you an example, right, the first one is really very classic, sorry. The first one is very classic, like a renewable resource must be used at or below the rate at which it can regenerate itself. This really came from like something like Lodka Volterra, right? Mr. Volterra was here, or at least the fish were landing here in Trieste, isn't that right? They were seeing how much fish was coming and the oscillations in the fish caches and so on. And we've learned through Lodka Volterra and other ecological analysis that if you harvest too much, you, the fisheries crash. If you harvest too little, it does different things. You can get oscillations. So this is just like, a systems dynamics, which is what those people, Dana Meadows and all, all the people from that Brian also talked about, they were, they were really concerned with. But you can start modeling these things uh, in various ways. Also, we saw that in, in Mateo's talk uh, in a different way. But this starts giving you a sense that you have stability in some places. The stability uh, you know, can be stable, but in this case, will oscillate in some ways, if you really believe the model, which is not bad for what it is. But if you consume above a certain rate, the system crashes, right? So if the consumption rate's too high. So this is a little analysis models. Everyone knows this model. So that's just like an example of the first one. And then you can elaborate and build models for the other two, if you will. It gets a little bit more complicated. But it's not rocket science, right? It's just even quite simple. It's just whether these models work or not. And so I think that's the spirit in which I think Matteo is trying to put these equations together. But you could put it in this context. OK. So I want to just. Spend, use this metaphor, this kind of model without even doing much math, and just ask a bunch of questions we've been asking during our week together, right? Beautiful week together in this beautiful place. So, so let's, go, let's go with this. And so, because, so I, I make the strong claim that because the first three are about energy and materials, and energy and materials are conserved by the laws of physics, um, their management in these cycles can be addressed at any scale at least from the physics and biology point of view. You can do it yourselves, each person. You can do it you know, each business, maybe each city. So you can address it in a distributed way. You can address it in a more aggregate way. So from that perspective, it doesn't matter. So what's the right scale? So we ask this question quite a lot. OK. So is it the question, is it for each one of us to take responsibility individually? Can you control the flows of, can you control the flows of carbon or the flows of um, metals yourself? Probably not, right? Because they get manufactured and they go around the world. At least at the moment, you cannot, you don't have a recycle. You can recycle some things in your home, but not everything, right? And you cannot produce all the food and all the materials and all the goods that you, you want in your home, at least the way we are now. So, you know, there are sci-fi books and movies where maybe you can just go to the machine and press the button and it happens. But at the moment, you cannot do that. So this is Probably there's some scope at individual level to do some things, but it's not enough. You know, or about building our institution. So I don't know what ICTP is doing to be, more, be greener, but almost every university is trying to do this and so on. How about businesses? So you see a lot of businesses procure, starting to procure their energy differently, uh, trying to say that they recycle many of the things they use. We don't know if it's greenwashing totally, but, you know, it's a good step, but, you know, and so, and so on. Cities are important. I see I snuck, I stuck them in a little bit, but nations, et cetera. So the point is that you could imagine that by acting across, uh, across a certain scale, like all individuals, all cities, all places defined in some other way, all nations, which is the model we have now, you could address this issue. So again, it still asks the question, what is the scale at which you work? And this is only answered by the fourth law. It's the scale at which people can get their act together literally, in order to deal with the problem. First, that they can deal with the problem, so the household's probably too small, but that they agree to deal with the problem. So nation's probably too big. You know where I'm going with this? I'm not going to push this point. But nation's been problematic because you have a lot of different people in them uh, with very different interests. But this is kind of, uh, it gets us to, uh, to that. And, you know, somehow businesses and, you know, uh, and governments are part of it, 
but you know, they don't contain the entire system. They're just part, a small part of a nation or a small part of the economy is, is run by businesses, right? There are other things. Uh, there are households and there are types of uh, institutions and so on. So this is just to say that you could, you could distribute this in different scales, but you have to ask what's the right scale for what, and that's kind of an interesting exercise. Okay. So those are just those two first sections, just to get us on the same page. I hope this is useful. I'm just trying, I'm showing you how I came to think about these things. But also, some of these backgrounds, uh, like the laws of sustainability and systems dynamics, and kind of the, um, uh, these various ideas are important as framing for the problem we want to see, even before we jump into models of opinion formation and so on. Yeah? I have a question about the previous? This one? Yes. So I'll take the microphone from this one. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <My role>. um, <laughs> one thing I don't understand is uh, how much um, the cause of the problem and uh, a big uh, limit to the solution is the fact that this sum is of an index that where the extreme is changing, yeah. right? Yeah, you're so, absolutely right. That's, that's the right question. So for example, the way I see it, we had some discussion in our group uh, about recycling, right? That all companies produce plastic. Now you and municipalities typically need to recycle it. And then you hope it's, the problem is solved. But you're not, it's not being solved at the same scale. And the scales in which the problem is to be solved cannot really solve the entire problem. And so we, we get fooled into what looks like a solution where we take responsibility and costs. But maybe the problem is upstream, that the company should not be producing plastic. They should actually be investing into different materials, designing packaging differently. I don't know. So, so in this way, by, by dumping the problem into a, to a different scale, which, which we often try to do, uh, you may just stopping it from being solved appropriately. Is that, but is also the fact that, then, I mean, when you talk about this, it's like you, you have a almost a static picture of the, of the system, right? Yeah. While, well, of course, it's expanding. I mean, population is growing, yeah. and the problems we have are, as you said, are also related to the fact that the population grew, right? Yeah, the population so, growth is a much scary problem these days than it was, yes. you know, 50 years ago. Yeah. The peak population worldwide of growth rate was 68, I think, yeah. the, the year the population bomb is written, I think. And uh, so, the, you know, even China now is contracting and so on in terms of population. So there's still population growth in South Asia and West Africa and so on, but it's less of a problem. Not to say it's not a problem. So, uh, so the problem is expanding, but if every new family also deals with what they need to do or every new business and so on, I'm just, assume, I'm just imagining that then you could have a system that could work that's distributed. The problem with these horizontals, right, is the problem that we've been dealing with, which is the problem of free riding and the problem of defection and so on, which is that maybe you recycle, but then I don't have to. I'm going to be lazy. Or maybe that business is nice, but this one's just greenwashing, right? And you have to have, in, in the horizontals, you need to have mechanisms, I'll get to this later, to coordinate how you know, these, these systems of equal, so to speak, are actually all contributing to the solution. Otherwise, you end up with some doing some, and then others not doing it, and then the ones that are doing it give up, and then the whole thing falls apart. Okay, that's a different consideration, but it's important. I'll get to that later. So there are many, cons I'm just introducing you frameworks that allow you to think about some of these things, but I think the questions are everything, right? I'm not giving you answers. Okay, so, um, so now I want to just speak a little bit about collective action, uh, and just introduce a few extra ideas from the ones we already discussed. So this is, none of this is original. It's just sort of a synthesis of some things I know. So this is a complicated slide. But um, I wanted to introduce, this is not meant to be exhaustive, but I think it's pretty complete, about ways in which people have thought, particularly in terms of modeling, but also in terms of con con conceptual frameworks about collective action. And so, you know, um, Mirta and Henrik kind of gave us a, sort of a, an intro. But then I try to put many of the talks here, you know, along various gradients. I'm sure that you will object to where I put you, but, you know, bear with me. It's, it's, it's not totally wrong, right? But so so in, in biology and evolution, we think about levels of selection problems, right? Precisely a little bit like what we're doing already. That may have nations, and you have cities, and you have households. And, you know, they're horizontals and verticals. And essentially, we belong to all these scales as people. And we act differently depending on which collective we belong to, right? So in the collective may be 
actually solving the problem or not. But this is usually thought in terms of transition individuality and kin selection and other things for which we have some theory in, in uh, Hamilton's rule and so on. Things we have some theory in ecology and evolution. Then there's a lot of game theory, which is not unrelated to the first, but that allows you to see what happens under certain rules of interaction and how they're iterated and the individuals are or are not coordinated, right? That's usually the gist of it. Um, then there are models of cultural evolution and learning. Again, these often are built on price equation like Hendrick's model or some network of interaction that also may relate to game theory. But they take a somewhat different, uh, a different uh, take in that you know, they have to be open-ended and so on. And I just said politics and inequality. But again, how do we see this emerge in networks or in some distribution of resources? I think we talked about most of these things. That's why sort of I see most of the names there um, on, the upper, on the upper right, the way you see it. But we didn't talk much at all about some of these things on the bottom. And I'm concerned with that. Because a lot of this comes mostly from the economics literature and related fields, um, and, and also organizational theory, a few other places. But a lot of this stuff is very important. If you want to talk to any policy think tank, to anybody who comes from that part of the world, uh, or, or some proper social scientist who comes from economics and sociology, this is what they know. They don't actually know the top stuff so much. They will know game theory, but not the rest. So there's sort of, uh, for example, aptly, aptly named book, which is quite well known in economics by your cousin Olson. It's different Olson, different spelling. Uh, Manger Olson, The Logic of Collective Action. This is quite famous book from way from the 60s. It was just to be, was reprinted. But it's about public goods and the problem of defection. It's related to the prisoner's dilemma. But he really, being an economist, really makes the point that it's very, once you create public goods, it's hard to exclude people from using them. And he argues that a lot of people will free ride. And so there's a problem there that needs to be resolved in some way. So he proposes economic solutions like markets and contracts and things like that to, to do with that. But he, sa he thinks that that's a big, big problem. And then there are things like you know, what markets can do. You know, it's sort of an Austrian thing, at least the original ideas. Um, and then there's the idea of transaction costs, for example, to create organizations uh, when you have both the ecosystem and the organism, or you have a firm and a market. What should be in the market, so being exchanged, and what should be inside the firm. And so the idea is often if you can get it in the market, you know, you, you reduce the size of the organization. You don't need to control it. But, but, but if, if you cannot, because it's not predictable, it costs too much or something, you need to internalize it. So there are questions here about the individual versus sort of the, the environment you can interact with. And, uh, and so in knowledge and endogenous growth, I'll tell you about this later, because this is something I work on. But you know, this was the Nobel Prize to Paul Roma and Bill Nordhaus. So this is kind of very important. Right? Nordhaus, even though these models are crummy crummy, we got a little bit from Dasgupta in the previous meeting. These are models uh, that people use, the IPCC and other people that are not economists even, used to kind of uh, discuss how economic growth and carbon emissions and consequences of uh, weather and disasters actually may, may play out in the future. So, so this stuff is some of the ways in which some of the things that we discussed there, which tends to be a little bit more microscopic, kind of become important. So I'm concerned that you know, there's sort of, we need to know this stuff in order to sort of work at the highest level. So this is what Mirta you know, warned you about, is that I was going to bring you a, like, a lot of our things that you kind of now have to know. And it's just, damn it. But, you know, but it's true. This stuff is not very complicated conceptually. The models are not that developed, but it's important. And it's a different way of thinking. OK, so I'm, I'm going to keep going. But you know, so for example, the last one, which is, sorry, the last one, which is really about common pool resources, is really Ostrom's theory and related theory. A lot of people, her students worked on this. Brian told us a little bit about it. But, uh, but it's really how you self-organize uh, common pool resources, and mostly about food, fisheries, and so on. This is very common in traditional and small-scale societies. But it has a lot of the properties in which you have to delimit the resource. You need to create transparency, which we heard, for example, from Joel, uh, from Plotkin a little bit about. So that's true. But then you know you create sort of um, institutions that manage that resource. They're kind of you know so communities can do this, but most of these models don't scale up very well to very large scales. And besides, they do require material flows or material resources that are sp usually spatially located, that people know where they are, and so they actually break a lot of the kind of things. They're very different as assumptions to the kind of things we're trying to do globally for climate and for development, like the sustainable development goals. So this is a good exercise, is to see all the things that break from Ostrom's kind of 
paradigm when you go to the kind of structures that we're building today in terms of addressing the climate problem. So in these, including the Paris Agreement and so on, we discussed it, describing these in group one yesterday, um, you know, we're trying to create structures of accounting, of pledging, that are public, of metrics that we follow over time. So the signals and the coordination are being created, actually. But they're just not good enough. They're not coercive enough. They don't coordinate the agents enough that China and the US are kind of just going for it and solving the problem of climate change. There's a lot of potential defection and self-interest that the mechanisms that we developed so far in terms of coordination and uh, of action and pledging uh, are not strong enough. They're, they're becoming transparent, but they're not strong enough. So one reason is whether we could use reputational signals or other signaling that you guys, particularly in psychology, have thought about that could actually force the hands of these coordination mechanisms to become a little less bureaucratic and a little bit more full of pathos, right? So that the right parties would do the right thing. But this is still sort of a work in progress. But you see a lot of the analytical elements starting to come in into what's being done in the UN. It's actually very interesting. We've never created a policy like this. So this is also from, from Robert. He had this idea of, uh, people use this idea in different ways. But this idea of due policy with backcasting, right? So what this means is that, for example, you look into the future and you say, well, you know, I want to have by 2050 or by 2030, I have to reduce my emissions this much. So this is a very tangible example. The sustainable development goals are more ambitious. So I want to be here. This point should be here in terms of magnitude. And now I have to build policy. Backcasting is the idea. You bring that point in the future to the present and you, you start discussing what I need to do today and tomorrow and the next day until, in order to get to 2030. So you basically have a control policy with an objective function in the future. You don't know how you're going to get there, but you have to uh, basically control to get there at that point. So this, this is kind of a new kind of policy that's coordinating the whole world, and that is different from what we had before. We're ju not just driving by the seat of our pants. We're putting objectives into the future. It's very interesting conceptually. But it's something that, uh, that we don't have the mechanisms to coordinate the parties to get there just yet. Or at least not well enough. OK, so, so. Do you think there There are elements, but I think they just bust a lot of the conditions that she would say would make these things work. So I think it doesn't apply. You need other mechanisms in many cases. So I'm, uh, that's, but again, it's a good exercise to compare the two. OK, are you, OK, OK. <laughs> you, you give so, temptation, temptation calls, yeah. <laughs> uh, so what, what, I mean, these uh, policies uh, you were mentioning look like uh, what one does in reinforcement learning, essentially. Yeah. You know, yeah, you should think you about know, it. Solve. Yeah. Now, uh, the issue is uh, this should be done uh, collectively. I mean, if yes. you think about, uh, uh, and uh, so, so this is what you were. Yes. So uh, it, it has both, exactly as you say. It has an element of an intertemporal, so uh, over time optimization problem, which you can think about. There's reinforcement learning, which is maybe the most powerful way we, we can conceive this. But there's also um, optimal control and a few other related methods that do this. And then, you know, but we do this in finance already with derivatives and all kinds of, there are kind of methods that kind of to do this. But then the problem is that it's a collective action problem to our theme here. So it's not just you getting there is coordinating everybody so that they do their fair. You cannot solve the problem yourself. You need everybody to do it. And so has the elements of the problems we've been discussing here of coordination and maybe games. You know, you need to coordinate the parties so that they collaborate instead of defecting and free riding, right? Exactly. So it's, it's all of it together. But you can start imagining, right, how it works, right? Yeah, exactly. Good. That's, that was my goal. OK. OK, so, uh, okay. so, so I, I'm just maybe these slides are a bit of a digression. But, but there are many. So, so what's the nature of the collective? So this says what you said. The, the collective action problem for sustainability is that in, in the human societies is that there are many coexisting forms of cooperation and competition, right? So we have, you know, we, we put into societies forms of competition in which the parties should defect from each other and try to beat the other party, like markets. That's what they're, they're doing, right? In principle, if the market's not rigged, companies are competing. And you know, uh, so for example, we have producers in a common market can compute, but employees within a firm have to cooperate, right? That's, that's what they're there for, at least by contract. Politicians are supposed to compete with each other, 
or people in different neighborhoods sometimes compete for resources because they want the public goods and so on. But citizens of the same city are supposed to collaborate because they live in the same city. So at one scale, you compete. At another scale, you're the same person still. You, you collaborate, and then maybe you compete, and maybe you collaborate. So we kind of, each one of us has all these dimensions built into our lives. And so this is kind of a levels of selection problem about where is competition, where should competition and cooperation should be. But, but these are the same entities. They're not different entities. And so what this leads to is this interesting problem of many identities, right? I like this because uh, there's this very interesting and I think important book that's a little less well known, though all these known, his books are well known, by a Mark Yassin called uh, Identity and Violence. And he wrote this book, and, you know, we have a lot of discussions uh, in the last few years for good reasons about identity and, uh, you know, inclusion and so on, and these are super important problems of society. But he's, he wrote this book after September 11th and the objectification of Muslims as terrorists, right? And uh, to him, really, this, this problem is that we've had this crazy dimensional reduction that we treat now all Muslims as terrorists. So every, you know, and you can go and pick on a different group and label them as whatever you want to label them. And this objectification stops people from collaborating, right? When we collaborate, you know, we are talking about this earlier, right? If I, if I didn't know you before, right, we can start talking about this and that. And there are dimensions in which we will compete. But then, you know, we found construal theory or language. And then, you know, Tom and I were having a good conversation. Maybe one day we'll write a paper about it. But we had to go around the bush and find the dimensions of, of cooperation, right? So people have many different dimensions, and they kind of bring to them the ones that may actually be aligned with cooperation, but they could also be competing. So this is just to say that this is kind of the reality of it. And often, again, in psychology, it's interesting to think about which identity you want to bring to the table. You want China and the US to bring to the table the fact that they're competing geopolitically or economically, or that they want to save the world and their world powers and their responsibility. They could be heroes, right? So you know, which one you invoke depends what attitude you're going to get. This is just to say something obvious, but this is kind of important. OK. And so you know, I like to talk about the, the collective action sandwich, which is basically cooperation, competition, cooperation, competition. But, uh, but the point is that you have to have a layer, usually, of cooperation on top, the bread. Otherwise, you know, the whole thing falls apart. And you know, this is the problem with international organizations, is that we don't quite have a good enough bread, right? Which, uh, anyway, so that's just to say that. So, um, OK, so uh, I'm kind of belaboring the point here a little bit. But, uh, but basically, there are these three points that came out, even in the first talk by Elgar Novotny, which are that, if you want to have uh, collective action, first you have to imagine a goal, right? What's the goal that's worth it for us to work together? And, and so part of the design is to discover what that goal is. So you could say for sustainability you already know what the goal is, maybe. But that's not always true when you bring it to small scales. Then you need information. You need a coordination mechanism that, is, that creates the transparency for the agents to collaborate with each other and know what the others are doing so that there's less chance of defection and free riding. And then once you obtain you know, some gains, you need to have fair redistribution of costs and benefits. So without these three elements, which are, of course, broad and you can decompose, uh, you don't really have a solution. So this is like, again, the fourth law. But the problem is that the limits to this dynamics come from many places that break these conditions. So for example, if there's a mismatch of payoffs in time so that the benefits only come in 30 years from now, it's very hard to do, so which is typical. Uh, if, if the collective payoffs are unknown or uncertain, you don't know if you're going to get the benefit, that's bad. If there's lack of trust between the parties and there's no transparency, or if there's disinformation, this is really bad because, again, the mechanisms of coordination are broken. It's just you can't do it. So, so this is part of the problem of collective action problems is if they pay later, they may pay very highly, but they pay later, and they're uncertain. You don't know for sure. So it's very hard to engage in that, right? But I, I think I'm an optimist, and I think humans are always thinking about what is it that we could do together that would be wonderful. So I kind of try to uh, do that. OK, so this is kind of laboring the point. But we don't have fundamental ways in which we understand collective action and attraction, uh, like in physics, uh, just fundamental forces. But so when we do all these things that we do, what are the reasons to do that? So I, I created this because I asked, you know, what is the vision of the future? that we really should be working for. And I typed into the Bing image generator, right? You know, happy city, society with unicorns and lollipops and double rainbows. 
and the future could look like this, or maybe this is the Microsoft future, right? But we were talking about AIs doing this for us, and you might get that, right? So I think the unicorn is nice, but I see a little glint in his eye that makes me worry already, right? That's sort of the, you know, it could be our next di dictator. Okay, so, okay, so, so, so now I want to get to this point of energy and information, okay? So it's, I'm gonna try to build sort of a simpler picture where these things start showing up. And this part, if you guys get tired and I get tired, I can go a little faster. But, uh, but I want to make a few, a few basic points. These go back to those diagrams and a few things I already introduced. The first thing, when you look at any agent in a complex system, unlike a particle in physics, they have internal dynamics of two things, fundamentally. The first is that they're a little dissipative system, right? They're a little, they have to spend energy, they need free energy coming in. Okay, so this is kind of interesting. So you cannot exist totally isolated. You need to find a way for energy to come in. Um, and, you know, that's without saying. But the second thing is that they need information. They always contain information. Now, what is information? Information is really, there's some information in the internal organization. I'm talking less about that, though that's important. I'm talking about what this energy is for. So once you have a little energy in the bank, right, a little energy in the stomach, what are you going to do with it? You have to have a behavior that at least gets you the next lunch, right? For us here, it's easy because the lunch is upstairs. But, you know, but we have to show up and go upstairs and so on. But in general, it's hard to do this, right? So this means that you have to coordinate your behavior your, in relation to an environment and its sources of free energy, which typically are stochastic. So this is what information is. The agent needs to predict certain aspects of the environment and act accordingly. And, and so, you know, again, it's, you need energy and you need to know how to get it and then you need to know what to do with it so that you get it and you're always doing this. And what this means is that every agent in complex systems, even a little bacterium, is always a little forward looking, at least till the next lunch, and has to uh, be predictive of these environments. Therefore, uh, looks like it's creating interesting behavior uh, as environmental conditions change. But this is kind of very important because these two quantities, energy and information, I know you know this, but this is very important and basic, are very different. Energy is like, if you have it, I don't have it, right? If you have 100 bucks, I don't have 100 bucks. Uh, you know, we're playing, but it's unlike the public goods game where magic happens, right? But in general, this is the nature. Energy is competitive, but information is collaborative. And why is it collaborative? Because if you know something I don't know, we can do something together, pull our resources, and act together to do something that's different, that I cannot do by myself and you cannot do by yourself. So, uh, so this means that we can access new resource pools, new behaviors, new parts of the environment that you cannot do individually. So this is very important. So this gives you a whole set of mechanisms by which now agents should actually come together and act in a coordinated way towards some benefit that is contingent but probable, and you go and do that game, right? So this is always open. It's always possible if you can imagine it, but then you have to coordinate and go through the cycle of doing the things we discussed before. Okay, so every agent, I like to talk about the fundamental agent in complex systems has a behavior with the environment, but it's always doing the cycle. It always has a reservoir of resources, of energy, ATP and a few other things, a little fat, and information, which is like, what should I do next? With that, with that energy and the experience I, I obtained before, so this is kind of, every agent has its properties. I like to call it maybe, uh, a complex atom or a catom or a paragon. I like the word paragon, even though it's a little pretentious. But you know, it's something like, it's, an, it's a minimal agent that has to have these properties. And the point is that every agent, like a firm or a nation, can also be written this way by a composition of agents that have these flows and so on. So these flows compose in interesting ways, but the non-trivial part is really in information. Okay, so um, I'm gonna skip this because it's complicated. And um, these are kind of where these models are and so on. But if you want to look at the, at the slides, the slides are available. It just gets, so, we, so this goes a little bit to what Matteo is asking, that we have some theories about how to do this, but it, because it has both this collective uh, element and this um, objective into the future, it's actually bigger than the paradigms that we have to do these. And we don't really have simple examples of how to build models like this, I, in, in my opinion. So we have models that are stochastic resource dynamics. I'll show you some of those in a moment. Uh, with Bayesian agents, which is optimal for prediction and information um, aggregation. 
We have levels of selection models, usually don't refer so much to energy, but refer to uh, fitness. And we have optimal control models, for example, in economics and engineering, that do their own thing, but exist in their own optimization space. So in complex systems, this has not yet come together. Okay, and, and there's this idea also uh, in psychology, I thought, sorry, I just, I just did something weird. Uh, we were talking to Thomas about this, so I put it in, which people operate at these different levels of the way they think about things, right? So they operate at a level in which it's the here and now, but they also operate at a larger psychological distance. You think about the future, you think about what you're gonna do next week, think about the people you might meet. And this is kind of strange, right? Because it seems that people actually, depending on circumstances, they call in a local picture when they're very urgent, they need to solve a problem now. But sometimes they invoke this larger picture where you can imagine the future and all the great things that could happen or bad things that can happen. And this is a higher level of construal. But as these guys say, this is a very famous paper in psychology uh, because in, it gives some structure to, to the structures that are necessary psychologically for people to engage in collaboration. You see that the dimensions are spatial, temporal, but social, that you need to collaborate and work and know more different people. And they're also, they have this one that's hypothetical. How sure is it that I could do this with those people? But anyway, but this is the last, almost the last paragraph in that paper, which is interesting, that says that human history is associated with expanding horizons traversing greater spatial distances, forming larger social groups, planning and investing in the more distant future and reaching farther back into the past. This is human development. In the first years of life, people go through the stage where they go from being local to being able to have higher and higher construal. So this also has sort of physiological and mental reflection in the processes of people. And it's known, this is kind of uh, belaboring the point, but it's known that people that often uh, have very harsh environments and develop in deprived environments cannot develop all the way to actually think about the possibilities of a larger world and different people and the great uncertainty. So you're more limited to survival in the here and now. So this stuff exists again at different scales. But I find this literature very interesting. It's quite qualitative. But one of the interesting things we're discussing is what are environments that uh, invoke higher construals and would allow people to be primed, to be collaborative and forward looking and so on. Okay, so I could almost end there, but I'm just gonna give you a little math maybe a little faster, about how some of these things come up. So uh, sort of a, work, a workhorse model for these systems is a very simple model that appears a lot in quantitative finance and uh, wealth and inequality models, which is called, Piketty calls it the one good wealth accumulation model. It's just a model of multiplicative random growth uh, where your resources, your energy or your money, your wealth, is basically a function of an income and a cost. It's that simple. You can generalize what it is. It could be a biological entity with food in, food out, or the costs, metabolic costs. So we saw versions of that here. But then the idea is that you write those things as a growth rate uh, times resources. So there's always this idea that the resources you have now, you could invest and you get a return. And this shows up as costs and, and, uh, and benefits, incomes and costs. Uh, and then in some cases you can create sort of an equilibrium, which is important for ecology as well as for cities. But the idea then is that when this growth rate is a fluctuating quantity, there are a bunch of properties that are sort of interesting, and you get log normal distributions, which are usually observed and so on. So just to show you that a theory like this at a minimum, sorry, at a minimum has two parameters. And these parameters have, this is kind of interesting, it's not super mathy. The first parameter is that there's a growth rate which is uh, averaged over time, over some window of time. And there's a so-called volatility, which are fluctuations in growth rates. So you know, if you invest in the stock market or you follow, that's very familiar. But this ap appears in almost everything, you know, money in, money out, and so on. So in general, in these problems, the growth rate that you get, that's the effective growth rate, is the average minus the volatility squared over two. The reason for this is the process is multiplicative. So to get intuition for that, it's kind of counterintuitive at first, but what happens if I, if I give you uh, $100, right? I just gave you $100. Cool, right? But now it went down 20%. How much money do you have? $80, right? And now it went up 20%. How much money do you have? 96. <gasps> okay? So, so the volatility went up and down, but your money went down. So that's that effect there that you get, that the volatility costs you. This also happens in, in, uh, in biology with the uh, with, uh, geometric mean versus the arithmetic mean. You know, there, there are discussions along the lines. But the point is, the volatility you want to minimize because it costs you, 
And the growth rate you want to maximize in general, because that's good, that's fitness and so on. But that one requires essentially stability, which is order and so on. So I put, I exaggerated, but I went to uh, Kay's talk and uh, uh, Carolina about democracy and dictatorship. So that one acts for dictatorship, but the growth rate requires innovation, growth, you know, doing things in different ways, and requires basically it, you know, a free society where people can f discover each other and discover new knowledge and so on. So these things kind of are finding each other in general. And you find environments, this is kind of gives you a classification of environments that's very interesting. So you can have environments, for example, where the volatility is high, but the growth rate is even higher, like venture capital or some very creative environment. Okay, that's maybe good. So people invest a lot, but because the growth rates are so high, even though you have high volatility. On the other hand, if you have a, a system with very low growth rate, the tendency is for people to really clamp down on volatility, right? And then you have a very, very orderly system that tends to be very, you know, very clamped down, like, you know, uh, the dictator and so on. So these things kind of fight each other. And so usually people only deal with volatility, they tolerate volatility only when they have high growth rates, which is hard to do. Okay. So, uh, so the properties of these systems is that basically you get log normal distributions of, of resources, which are very broad and therefore very unfair. But that also over the long time, you get more predict predictability. The noise goes away over the long time, which is sort of interesting. Uh, and so there's a time scale at which you, you actually perceive that there is growth and you can start controlling and planning for it. Before that, you don't see it. So this goes to the collective action problems that if you start engaging to create growth and so on with people, at first you see just a lot of noise and uncertainty. And it's only later that you might see the payoff. So this is very tricky. You have to believe that's going to be there. There's a leap of faith problem. Okay? Anyway, just, just I could show you more of the details. Some of this is published and so on. And so there's a critical point. This is discussed many times uh, also by people in the literature, some of this in the collapse literature, between growth rates and volatilities and how this gets organized and so on. Now, these parameters come from populations and complicated things underneath, but just to give you uh, sort of the general sense that all these systems are very, very um, uh, somewhat unstable. And they can do very well and grow, but they can also crash and, and, uh, and so on. So part of the problem here is controlling this volatility and how to, how to do it. And the other problem is how to create, create the creative part. So I just, I'm going to go th through this quite, quite fast. There, there's sort of papers published, but you can control the volatility essentially by some uh, control mechanism, that what it has to do essentially is to smooth the variation over longer times. And in order to do that, the easiest way is to have savings. So they have a pool of resources that if times are bad, I can withdraw from savings and times good, I can basically put them there. But you can, you can do this individually to some extent, but usually you need to do this collectively, which creates again the problems of common pool resources and so on. But uh, so you know, you can go and, and, you know, it's like a thermostat and so on, but it's for growth rates, and you can iterate this with sort of control algorithm. Okay. But the most important thing that you do out of doing all this is basically that uh, you need to create a pool of resources like a bank account that is called, allows you to consume more or less in good or bad times. And, you know, you, you get then a log normal. What this is doing is making the incomes and costs over a long period of time being well aligned. Otherwise, they're fluctuating independently, but through a control mechanism, you make them fluctuate in a dependent way. And this is actually what explains that you could get a log normal out of that. Like for biological organisms, the same thing. You have energy in, you have expenditures, but you accumulate it over some period. You know, bigger organisms can do for longer periods. And this then creates sort of a mechanism where the costs and benefits become entangled, not because they're necessarily entangled in the environment, but because you make them so as a source of control. Okay, so we do this by insurance, pension funds, government social services, corporate bailouts, you know. Uh, but usually, the, you know, the loss and damage fund is an attempt at doing this. But it's sort of, you have to pull resources sort of as an insurance policy, effectively. But this, this already asks for, for sort of a certain kind of, um, of, of resource pooling. The growth rates have a different character. This is really where the information comes in. And uh, this is usually treated in the context of betting models or investment models. So there's a lot of the literature in investment. And, uh, but this, uh, what's interesting about this is that people re recognized a few decades ago that um, this leads always, so 
you can ask, so in a bet, there's this problem that if you were to invest everything in one bet, it's a bit like the prisoner's dilemma, then you would invest everything in the most promising uh, you know, uh, state that would have you the highest return. But if you do this over the long term, you act differently. You do a mixed strategy. And this mixed strategy actually leads to information. It's, you have to guess the probabilities of the environment, and you put money down uh, in proportion to the probability distribution, not just the, the highest state. So the consequence of that is that the growth rate, this is provably optimal. You know, much has been written. This is kind of mythical in finance because it, under very general conditions, it's provably the best strategy to invest on anything. So it's unbeatable. Okay, it's kind of crazy. So this is, it's thought that people like D.E. Shaw and a few legendary investors kind of picked this up and implemented it in some of their own ways, but we don't know for sure because they won't tell you. But these people are all studying information theory and these kind of models early on. But the idea is that if you can predict the environment, you can act accordingly to have the lowest costs and the highest returns. And so if you're very wise that way, you, you grow the fastest. So you need to acquire this knowledge. You can acquire it to, through experience and so on. But it means that the growth rate of resources, the average growth rate, is the mutual information between the organism and the environment. So it's kind of interesting. It's very different. It's the opposite of entropy, almost, in some sense. That now, you, instead of entropy, which is about uh, disorder, we're now talking about a reduction in entropy and information, which is what allows you to beat the second law that allows you to grow. So it's kind of, it's kind of interesting. But this is why information is so important. It's actually. Uh, then it becomes the fitness. I'm not going to show you that. But in, when you do certain mappings and so on, fitness, once average over the population over time, becomes effectively um, an information as well. So what is E and what is this? E is the environment, and S, uh, sorry, are the signals that uh, sort of the internal states of the agent. So you know some things. You're kind of predicting the environment. That's your S. Or maybe you, your senses tell you something. It's a signal. And the environment has its own states, and you kind of are trying to see what the environment's going to do and put your resources in the right places. So you want to be coordinated with the parts of the environment that matter to you, and the best coordination means the highest information. So it's cool, right? All right. This is, by the way, you know, this is also, uh, formally at least, the details are quite different, but it's what people in machine learning and Bayesian learning are doing. And machine learning is Bayesian, otherwise it's not optimal. All right. So I'm almost at the end, um, but I want to just tell you about collective agency and information, which I promised I would show you. So I wrote this paper a long time ago, and I realized this, but, uh, but I, I just am going to give you the gist of it. So this is actually in a cognitive science journal and so on. Um, but you know, when we talk about information, there are actually two kinds. Information has sort of a spectrum of possible things. There's the kind in which each, if you have a society like these fish, each part is quite predictive of the neighbors, right? Because they're all aligned. That's what these algorithms and what we think the fish are doing. So what this means is that the fish are very redundant, meaning if I know what one fish is doing, I know what the other fish is doing, because they're very entangled. Now, people do this, but it's not so interesting, right? We, we do this when the teacher calls us or in a dictatorship, right? People don't want to put their heads up. But this is redundancy to, so the, what people think is going on here is that to the predator, all the fish are looking like, don't look at me, look at the other guy, he's just like me. Uh, you know, so, and if there are lots of them, then maybe I have, you know, one in a thousand chance that I'm the one being eaten. So that's best I can do, right? But it's kind of like you don't want to be in that situation, right? That's not what humans would prefer to do, right? On the other hand, there's another property of energy, of, of information, for, sorry, called synergy often, which is the opposite, is that you end up with uh, uh, actors, agents, that actually know different things, are doing different things, but if they co can coordinate that knowledge, they can actually see the big picture. So that the big picture is more than the sum of the mutual information that they have in the environment. This is the metaphor is the blind man and the elephant, right? They all get it wrong, but if they can only pull their information together, they say, ah, oh, it's an elephant, right? But it's the same thing with building an airplane or writing a complicated paper, right? None of us can do it, but together we can do it. And we can produce something that's bigger than the sum of the parts because the parts have complementarities. And this complementarity is a nonlinearity in that growth rate that actually creates an effective force for collaboration. But it's paid out in the growth rate, right? So it's kind of into the future. <clears throat> okay. So we wrote a bunch of papers about this. I'm going to skip this, but uh, Jordan's been here, and so he's a great guy, and he's thinking about what to do next with his career, so think of him. 
Uh, I'm going to go a little faster uh, on this, uh, skip some of these things which are preliminaries, and just get to the point about information, which is uh, in this paper. So you basically get the collectives that are most, um, that are most um, uh, effective are collaborative collectives that maximize this mutual information of the parties. So you want to actually have diverse organizations that have all the right functions in close uh, coordination because that increases the growth rate. So we call this the principle of maximum synergy. I think other people must have said it. But this is kind of an elaboration of the of principle of maximum information for, for collectives. And so you can show, uh, essentially, so this is how it works. You have an information in a bunch of signals, which I know we think of different agents. This is just information theory. You can decompose them into multiples. That's sort of the decomposition that, that paper works out. But it means, basically, that that term R can be positive or negative, uh, and it's either redundant or synergetic, depending on whether the mutual information, or the signals are very coordinated, but they're less to do with the environment, then that's redundancy. But if they actually get coordinated vis-a-vis -vis an environment, that's synergy. So there's a way to map this to, to mathematics. OK. So the point is that um, the, the total information in these organized ensembles is more than the sum of the parts when there is synergy, and it's less than the sum of the parts. It's simpler when there's redundancy. I mean, that's what redundancy means. And it's equal when they're independent. So all, each agent just has their independent piece of information. So there are these th three different regimes that make things somewhat interesting. And so you can put this together, again, into the models I was showing you, into an information. And so the idea here is that you end up with uh, a pooled resources dynamics <laughs> where the information is basically given, you compare the individual with their mutual information and their costs to the collective with their pooled information and their costs, which is now capital C. And so this is like Hamilton's rule. You can ask, you know, when is better to be a collective? And it means that it's better to be a collective when the returns, which are different from, uh, this is the rate at which, uh, sorry, this is the redistribution of the pool resources back to individual I. So to the individual I, what they get out of the pool resources and the growth rate has to be bigger than what they get, can get by themselves and the difference between the costs. So again, you just see here that if the information of the collective is much higher, because it's now pooled, then it's much better. We should do that. But it depends a little bit. If the costs are also much higher, then it doesn't pay off. But if the costs are not so much higher and the costs of the individual are high, then this is less important and this is always satisfied. So these are sort of the conditions that you can start describing and so on. So, so that's more or less what I wanted to show you, that information creates this interesting glue, this attractive force for collective action. But then it needs to be implemented. Information uh, expressed this way means that these agents are really coordinated. They're really acting together as a joint probability state. So they're not defecting on each other and doing different things now and then. It's when they're locked. So for the prisoner's dilemma, it means they're always cooperating predictably. So we, now you have a joint state. OK, so imagine, so I'm finishing. Imagine the future. In this one, I asked not for lollipops, but for balloons. Wow, right? What a difference. Um, and you know, so this is like, you know, Elsa knows this, like those, those corny things that architects do, and they're going to show you how they're going to redesign the street, right, and build a park. But now even better, right? So remember to imagine the future. And you may not want to leave it to Microsoft to imagine that future, right? Because you may get that. Maybe there's a better version, right? <laughs> OK, just saying. <laughs> but but the, point, the point I want to make is that humans are endowed with this really, really magical thing that I want us to think about as well, which is that we can imagine amazing futures, right? And they're always there for the taking. As if only we could act together, right? We could get world peace. We could get a sustainable future. We could get all kinds of things. If only we could agree that we want to get there. We have the imagination to do it and the means to do it. But the problem of coordination, defection, and organization of societies and action to do that is very hard. OK. I like this one better. Uh, anyway, remember that the ingredients to take you there, the mechanisms, are to have a coordination mechanism that's transparent and predictable. Otherwise, people don't do this because there's always defection. So this usually is an informational layer that I can see what you do. Maybe I can see what you're going to do. And I can see if it was fair, if you put in enough money and so on. Once that transparency that we saw in some of the talks, I think 
Plotkin was talking about this, then that becomes possible because the joint state is, is being activated. Then you need, to, once you create that, you need to also redistribute the costs and benefits fairly, which is tough because there's no sort of inversion to tell you exactly what the distribution should be. So people just must feel that's fair. Okay, so under these conditions then, you know, the future is all lollipops and unicorns and we could get there, but it's in doing these things that's difficult. And I thought, remember also, you know, there's this famous thing since we're talking about Anna Ostrom that I sometimes use, but she's famous for Ostrom's law. This is really a dig at the economist, right? But, uh, but uh, Ostrom's law is that a resource arrangement that works in practice can also work in theory. Uh, and so, you know, there are many things in the world that already work or don't work maybe perfectly, but they already are a beginning of things that are working and so on. So instead of like reinventing everything, I think actually the UN system, the kind of policies that we're kind of implementing with the kind of metrics that are associated with them, they're kind of working already. They're pledges as we saw and their commitments and carbon emissions are going down actually in most developed countries. They're just not working well enough, right? So uh, I think it's important to take what's seriously happening already, but analyze them in ways like people like us can. And then, you know, since they're working in practice, they should also work in theory, but by having theory, we should maybe improve how they can work in practice as well. So that's it, thank you. You can get the slides there, and of course, plugging in the book there. Thank you. Questions? Thanks, so it was really uh, thorough and, uh, and interesting. I, I want, I just um, a doubt, I want to be annoying on one, one, one part which I really didn't understand. Uh, you put two labels on information and energy. Uh, energy is competitive and, label, and information yeah. is cooperative, but I can imagine situations in which, for example, in, for animals, I don't know, information can be competitive. Yes. If, I am, uh, if there are few repair from predators, and I know where they are, I don't want to share that information because I may want to keep that and go there, or in human society also. If, right. if the kind of game we are playing, information is precious and it's gonna give me an advantage, then maybe I don't want to share that. So, and the same thing for energy can be is that we need facilitation to different, it depends on the organ. If you're interacting with someone identical to you, maybe it's harder, but already if, if you're interacting with another thing in other species which is which facilitate the income of it like having energy uh maybe uh maybe that can be cooperative in a, in a, in a sense so i don't understand those labels there uh i see that it's a, a sort of a simplification but yeah i mean <coughs> i i think it's interesting for you t for us to think about the examples you just brought up like step by step um i'm i'm gonna just attempt to do it but you, but you know i probably won't do a great job out of it I mean, I think energy, the problem is that it's conserved. So either you use it or I use it, but we cannot both use it at the same time. So it's a rival good, as economists like to say it. So you can give it to me if you think you're gonna get something from me. Otherwise, if you have any element of self-interest, you wouldn't do it. So you give it to your kids, right? And you give it to uh, people you care about and so on. But it's really truly a gift you don't get back as energy. It's gonna be used up. The advantage of energy, uh, information, you're absolutely right. Information can be shared easily. It's very hard to create. It's very hard to learn in the first place. So there's a, a whole uh, discussion around that, the properties of information also in policy. So Paul Romer, for example, who got the Nobel Prize for, for just basically realizing that information is a non-rival good in the sense that you just said. We can share it, and I can produce something with it that, I don't have to pay you back, right? So there are many examples, but one that people that, in classical discussions like the calculus, we don't pay Newton anymore for the calculus or Leibniz, but you know, everyone uses it. So information has this long, or the, you know, or the alphabet or you know, all kinds of things. So information has this long tail that can be used and reused and so on, and it can keep creating uh, good results. So that's very important. It cannot be contained usually. Uh, but it can also, it has this property of synergy that information doesn't have. When we work together with different pieces of information, we can often solve different problems. That's what I was referring to. Now, it is true that if, if I think in your example, the person that gets your information is going to use your resources and eat your lunch, then you're in competition. But it's through the dynamics of information when it's acted upon to get the energy that you're going to get using the same method. Maybe. But we can discuss that. Um, yes. Um, 
Oh, you, you, sorry, you're in charge. So you're in charge. Sorry. Uh, it, so thank you so much. It's, um, the presentation is really, really great. Um, I, I have a comment regarding to the law, law of sustainability. You mentioned uh, very often uh, Martia Sen during your presentation, the Nobel Prize, and the, in the last point of the law of sustainability, you, uh, also you say that to, to, in terms of the resource, distribute the resource fair among, among of the actors, I will call like right. these actors, uh, maybe not equal, but fair, fair, right. fair. So Those are the um, words they use. Sorry? Those are the words they use in the yes. formulation. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so regarding with that, Martia Sem has a very so a beautiful initiative because um, regarding to the Bank of the Poor, and he <coughs> developed, you know, of course, but I, I would like to say, uh, um, uh, the initiative in, in financial part for microcredit so with a very low input that mm -hmm. uh, this bank, uh, the Bank of the Poor, inject in a small communities mm -hmm. of, of ladies to create micro uh, enterprises, it has a, a very high uh, input in the, in the society. And this kind of inspiration in small ladies create a, inspiration, a channel of inspiration to and you know, they like this to do that, and, uh, and it's really, really great. And also this kind of initiative about microcredit are implemented by, by big in, uh, banking institutions because they have this concept now to lend uh, microcredit to people that doesn't have uh, easy, yeah. call in that way, easy access to, to credit. Right. So it's in different levels, so it's really right, right, great, right. and it's collective action. So there are many concepts, I mean, this uh, other, discussion and presentations, that what are concepts of justice and how do we make it fair and so on. I think it's, in practice, it's very hard to say what it is in absolute terms. I think, uh, you know, you start with the initial conditions we have, which are always unfair, but if you can work to actually make them a little bit better, it's already something. But anyway, there are questions like this, and Amartya certainly thought a lot about justice and fairness. Yeah. This, maybe, okay. No, uh, yes, uh, I was just um, thinking about this uh, synergy, uh, and uh, so you are still uh, referring to the Kelly game, uh, to the proportional, uh, uh, no. I mean, the long term, I mean, because what is interesting is uh, in this Kelly game is that uh, this optimal strategy, uh, it's uh, completely independent uh, of the payoffs. Yeah. So, and this is, uh, I was thinking maybe this is what makes it, I mean, um, maybe there is, there is a general, uh, say, uh, trade-off between the fact that when you are really long-term, then uh, you should not care about the payoffs. You should only care about uh, the, the probabilities. Well, you to, yeah, you need to have a payoff, but it's the, and, uh, the mathematics tells you yeah, that you need to align with the uh, with the probability of the environment, and that's yeah. what you. The way the problem is set up is the actionable. There are various and also versions. sorry, and sorry. also this may be also uh, a difficulty if you want to. Um, get consensus or if you want people to agree on a long-term property uh, uh, strategy that does not take into account at all payoffs, no? On the... um, I mean, yeah, I, I, think, um, I think the payoffs are not usually known in most real life circumstances. I think there's a perception there are good payoffs, you know, with the unicorns or with the climate change or whatever uh, solution, but we don't know what they are exactly. So that's one, just one general argument. Uh, there's no table that tells us what it's gonna be uh, in most situations. I, I think that the, um, 
there are variations on the Cali formulation, which I used here, that, uh, that have somewhat different structures. And it's important, you know, what all these models are predicated on is that there's sort of a free lunch in the environment. There's energy, energy or resources to be taken that if only we knew how, uh, we can go and get them. Um, so, so that's important. It's just that you need to coordinate with, with the statistics of the environment in, or of that environment in order to, to get them. Uh, there are models of this like for stock markets which are a little different. There are models also when you port this kind of way, this mathematics to uh, biology and to evolution, it's something I'm right, just writing up, you can do game theory with it and so on as well. In those cases actually, um, they're, they're simpler in that in some sense, once you have payoffs of a certain structure, the system just evolves in a certain way, as we know from the analysis of, of prisoner's dilemma and so on. So one has to get into the math to see what these issues are. It's important there are positive payoffs on average, but the magnitude of the payoff, as you point out in the Kelly problem, is less important. If you didn't have positive payoffs, you wouldn't play. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, earlier I talked about resources and information, but, uh, and also yesterday there was a discussion about pledges and you know, how incredulous yeah. people are about that. But it seems money is you know, what bridges the, the, the two I ideas, resources and information. But my, and it's also used to, to convey information as well. So my question is, is do you think it's, it's a sufficient mechanism, this pricing and, you know, how, and, the, and the time scale that it works in? Because fundamentally, it's a, it's, a, you know, it's a concept that it's just an amount and it, it's not even a resource. It's, it's money, the, the, the idea that you can put the, the, the price tag on it. How, how does it work out? Is it, is it a sufficient quantitative basis for all this? Well, I call it resources because it's not always money. It's anything that um, gives you a return that you care about. I mean, in, in biology, it would be energy, but you can put that energy in specific terms of the kinds of food and so on, and other, and other nutrients and so on. So I think that it's not essential that it's money, but but because any complex system requires resources to function, that's necessary as a component. But it's basically quite simple. The argument here, it's a little bit like in physics, right? We think about uh, position and direct and momentum, right? Way, there's where you are and where you want to go. This is kind of a generalization of that idea. You have so much energy and you have to decide what to do with it in order to keep going. And so information really is telling you an allocation of this, this resource, whatever it is, to certain choices that you have vis-a-vis -vis the environment you live in. Once you bring this to the pledges and so on, you know, we're just creating a common pool pledge, in this case, with so the example of loss and, 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 uh, and damage, such that, I mean, we discussed this a lot in the group and it's hard to convey in discussion. So that pledge is, is, is meant to be uh, so that countries that experience disasters can pull from this and solve their own problems, so to speak rather than, than creating a problem where the injured party has, creates a consequence for the, you know, for the donor country. I mean, that's one of the logic from the donor country point of view, is that it may be not only fair, but good for them to do this, because it solves the problem of them having to act later. So it's almost like an insurance policy for them, but also for the rest of the world. So there's that way of thinking. So, so you have the, the, how it's gonna be used in detail is not prescribed, but it's prescribed for a certain set of uses. So I think, I think it's enough to reason through a lot of the problem. If you wanted to solve the problem of loss and damage without money, you know, you could imagine that you could pledge a resource of, we're gonna show up and we're gonna help you deal with the flood in some other way. But that's not what the mechanism was called for. And this is probably reflecting the fact that yes, we live in a world that money kind of is supposed to be the means to solve those problems. But, um, it, you know, in the Sustainable Development Goals in number 17, which is the last one, it calls for a lot of knowledge exchanges and knowledge transfer and so on. So that's about transferring information, if you will. So there, the mechanisms are there if you look for them from this analytical point of view. And sometimes money and sometimes information, sometimes both. But both have value in the sense that the future value of money or any resource depends on information, right? If you have money now and you invest it all wrong, you're not gonna have money later, 
right? So that's the point, is like the future value of money is given by information, that's why it's the growth rate. <clears throat> Any other question? This is not gonna be well formulated, but I'll give it a shot. So, so you talked about Ostrom's things, and for Ostrom's systems, a lot of these are systems that evolved over a long period of time, Yeah. right? So they're slow systems, they're organic, people trust each other, they seem to trust each other, yeah. right? Um, and then I can juxtapose that against cities, where you're talking about things that are happening really fast and really quickly, mm -hmm. and you've still gotta have trust, and I think trust works in a way that smooths out, right, this, this, this variance yeah. that you're talking about. Um, because it allows, you can make something, and if you trust that I'll pay you back in the future, then you'll give me something, right? right? So we can do that kind of thing. And so I just, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the way you scale Ostrom's ideas to really fast-moving cities, and maybe there's some comp component of trust in there or something like that, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, it's an excellent question. Um, I think, if I may even uh, reformulate the question to some of these mechanisms, um, it's, uh, you need to create, so once you don't know everybody and where they live and can go and say, Joe, you really should show up, come on, uh, then you need some other mechanism that scales up to larger entities with more heterogeneous agents and so on. All the things that kind of break some Ostrom's <laughs> assumptions, you need to come up with something. Now, Ostrom's you know, mechanisms were kind of emerging self-organized ways in which people in relatively small communities dealt with common pool resources. Once you go to a city, cities are good examples because they're always kind of pushing on that. They have always have communities of strangers to some extent. Then what typically happens is that they create structures at different levels, also something that Ostrom talks about. But you definitely have, to some extent, cultures that are formed about what's polite and not. Polite is also has its etymology back to cities. But then you got institutions. So this is what the economists then like to talk about institutions. But these are institutions like, you know, there's law enforcement, there's laws, and there's laws of law enforcement. If you defect too badly, we're going to go get you. You have obligations that are kind of coercive. You have to pay your taxes, right? You have laws about how to use the park uh, or, you know. Um, but then you also have a lot of choice. You can contribute to your neighbors and so on. So there are, there are kind of mechanisms at many different levels. It is known that communities that, um, that don't benefit from institutions, they're formal, and that uh, don't have a lot of material resources like money, they depend a lot on these self-emerging mechanisms that they need to create collective agency and so on. Um, but, so that is typically poorer communities. You see this a lot if you work, you know, work we do with nonprofits at the local level and so on. That's their preoccupation, is creating Ostrom-like things in urban environments where people know each other, for example. They create a lot of savings groups where people save together. And that really gives you a signal that you can count on them because there's a schedule of contributions and you see that books. You know, there are all these things that you can see how well people are doing. And they have to vouch for each other so they don't have, they don't have collaterals or assets, but they have each other vouching and this is commonly microcredit. So that's one example where trust is built into a system. And then you have, you know, the institutions of cities and nations which allow you to scale up, however imperfectly, to larger scales and get people to coordinate elections, and all the other things we talked about. Though those things are ways of coordinating mechanisms and creating some rules of behavior that kind of stop the really bad things. But, they, you know, they're weak sometimes. Yeah, yeah no, no, that, that's, that's interesting. So as you're scaling the system up, you need, you need higher and higher sort of meta agents. Yes, yes, exactly. Right, rules new, of law. New structures, to, yeah. To, right. Exactly. Um, so time. when we scale the system up to sort of a national level where we don't have rules of law above that, then we can expect well, we have the UN that. with the stuff that's emerging, as you can see. There are pledges, there are intentions, there are treaties, there are some funds pledged, there are targets that people pledge. So this is emerging, this so is what happening. it is. Okay. Okay. I would say it's happening, but okay. Okay. I would encourage each, us together and us individually to think about why is not better. You know, you see, you can compare those to institutions at the national level or city level, as well as to self-organizing mechanisms like Ostrom is describing and you could see that some ingredients are missing, right? So there's no coercion, uh, there's, no, uh, there's no great transparency about uh, the pledges and the verification that the pledges, whether it is for carbon reductions or, or to put money in the bank, were 
fulfilled, and depending on the quantity, it's different. This is why people like us are doing all this research, right, to kind of have uh, attribution of carbon emissions and methane emissions and all this stuff be transparent. So we're building this. So we can set up a rule structure. Yeah. So with that, we can say, well, China says this number is this, but it's not, or Texas has all these methane blooms. Uh, yeah, so I think that the informational structures that reveal, you know, whether people are cooperating or defecting, to put it simply, and that could lead to corrections and transparency are being created right now. We scientists are creating them to a large extent. And, but we should think about them that way in this analytical framework is all I'm saying. Yeah, thanks, Luis. So much, so much stuff, so much going on in my mind. Um, so one thing about energy flow, right, and it, obviously it flows and second law is, is always there, but pathway matters, right? So, so maybe it's cooperative across scale but not within scale. And I say that meaning that mm -hmm. if energy flow hits a rock and just radiates back to space, mm -hmm. it doesn't do much, but if it hits the plant and then goes across upscale or downscale or whatever. And, and even a better example might be the um, electric power plant. It gets energy, it gets the, the water hot enough to make steam, you got the electricity, and it's no value to the electricity plant for the hot water, but you can pump it to your house and use it as you know, service water or something, or whatever, right? right. So, so the energy, as it's going down gradient, can have multiple uses. Absolutely. And I think that's an important thing that somehow always is forgotten in the energy part of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't talk about, I mean, there's all this work. Yeah. I know you know uh, Odom stuff and so on about energy hierarchies and right. so on. It's interesting, but of course, an ecosystem is energy hierarchy. This is partly why it's much more stable than some of the population models tell us, is that they're, you know, they're very constrained by energy flow, right? They only, you can tell me, there are only five levels or six levels in ecosystems. There's a lot of 90% energy loss per level. That's the rule of thumb, right? So it's very constrained, but, but as you... As you build another level, you can create another way of making a living, right? And have different creatures and so on. And usually when you have these places that can bring a lot of energy in, like a big city, a modern city, then you create all this complexity, right? Because you, 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 you actually are co-opting the energy flow into right. the system. Uh, whereas an ecosystem usually is more limited to whatever you can catch, right? And, and so on. So, so we create these energy hierarchies very intentionally, but I think that then... Across levels, you can have new uses, right, of the products and the energy that was created, whether we eat them or there's new products to be consumed or something. But at the same time, so that can be a cooperative, a vertical uh, connection is maybe a cooperative or at least a multi-level uh, selection cooperation dynamic. But at the horizontal level, you usually have entities of the same kind, right. which may be cooperative or competitive, but you can have firms competing, or you can have cities competing or nations competing. Yeah, my, my question was actually going to be about, you mentioned at the very beginning you were going to say something about degrowth, and, mm. I, and I, I didn't hear that. So I still want to hear your comments, but, but to preface that would be, um, I mean, you mentioned Piketty, and you mentioned uh, you know, he's, he's you know, more or less discovered the inequalities that come out of the system. We could have redistribution, of course, as one way of maybe getting at that fourth law, but I would go back a little further. I, I also recently stumbled upon, um, I'm going to say his name wrong, but this Georges Bataille, who's a, also a French guy, wrote The Accursed Share. Uh -huh. And his idea was that because you, you nicely showed the general theory for growth, that you reinvest your profits for more growth and, and you have this resource um, scaling. And, and his solution to that was he, was he called that The Accursed Share by saying that that you basically at some point can't, if you always reinvest and always grow, that you, again, exceed your, your natural constraints or boundaries. Or I'm, I'm botching his, his idea a little bit, but basically his point was that you just, you hold a big bonfire at some point. You just torch it. It's the accursed share, the share that should not be reinvested. Uh -huh. And he gave examples of like communities, you know, older communities that would have a big festival. You know, right. they, 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 they would like basically burn through because they knew that the, right, the right. wealth accumulation the storage of the wealth was more dangerous than just like right. burning through it. And, so, and that's yeah. not really degrowth, but it's, it's another way of, of either flattening the distribution or, or not, not encouraging growth, right? So that's... I mean, there are many things in what you say, yeah. so I'm just, I know we probably have time, right? You have to finish. Yeah. But I'll just say two, two or three things, try to say them quickly. Uh, to to degrowth, I think, you know, um, I think the way we... So what's important about growth? It's not really growth. I mean, even economists kind of know this. It's kind of the ability to have, you know, as a person, as a firm or whatever, to have resources to function, materials, enough energy, and so on, to do what you want to do. I mean, that's also Marcia Sen's version of 
human capabilities effectively. So it's not that you need always more energy, but often, you know, as systems, we end up doing more things and so on, and that's a good thing. But it doesn't mean that you're, uh, so energy always needs to be sourced because of the second law. There's plenty of energy in the world, like sun, you know, we don't use all this energy, it's just coming down. So I don't think that that actually is a big constraint. If we chose to use more energy, we could use it renewably. We have, you know, we're still working in these systems, but there's plenty. I think that the part I've been discussing with Sanjay is whether with the resource flows, right, like carbon, of course, but many other things, that's where a lot of the destruction is happening. And that's much harder to, to avoid. But one of the things that we're already doing, but of course we have to do better, is to cycle these materials in a way that's more contained or more controlled and doesn't do all that damage. And, you know, we've been imagining that you can cycle materials more quickly at a smaller scale within a city, say, or within a building for water or some things. And that will likely save you some energy because it's more local, but it will also be faster. So you can, you, you can have a faster rate of using a material, which is basically what GDP is. So you could have growth in that sense by manipulating and understanding how the system actually works and making the things that are actually important for the functioning of each agent cycle more quickly, which need not, may, but need not use a lot more energy, but that can be renewable. So if you understand the logic of the system, you can make it work differently. I'm against degrowth because if you ever look at poverty or places that became poor after becoming rich, including the Midwest of the United States or the people we work with in Africa and so on, poverty is a terrible thing. And, you know, it's a wonderful thing in the world that we've actually took a lot of people out of poverty in, in our lifetimes. Uh, but, you know, we have to f create a form of prosperity that's not, you know, busting the planet. And I think from the arguments we just mentioned, there are ways, but you have to understand the real nature of what's important and what could be manipulated. And I think we're not doing that well enough yet. Sorry. But there are ways. Okay, so let's thank Luis again. Okay. And uh, now we move to the coffee break and I would say we come back at 11.30.